Welcome uh, to our final session. We're um, we're in the final straight now. Um, it's been uh, several days. A lot of information uh, has been exchanged. Obviously, not through our uh, usual mechanisms of uh, talking in the hallway, but uh, as much as possible, we want to try and uh, capture some of the key points and, and have some discussion. And and to do that. Um, uh, we've been blessed with the uh, willingness of two of our, our industry opinion leaders to spend us some time with us for a few minutes to uh, at least give us uh, their impressions and talk about uh, where the industry's at, uh, the 2020, the keynotes, uh, uh, key issues that came out of the meeting for them and just uh, and just have a conversation about uh, where we might be going uh, in the future. So our, our two uh, volunteers uh uh, neither need uh, a lot of introduction, um, and I'll say uh, uh, a couple of things about them. They're both very experienced uh, swine veterinarians. They both have uh, a lot of experience in uh, the U.S. industry and also uh, internationally, and they're both uh, recipients of our uh, Science and Practice Award. So, uh, first of all, um, uh, Dr. Gordon Spronk, uh, who's uh, chair of the board at Pipestone, uh, and Gordon was our 2011, uh, sorry, 2011 uh, uh, recipient of science and practice. And I think perhaps the most exposed person at the meeting is our other uh, volunteer, Clayton Johnson, who is this year's recipient. And uh, Clayton, I think, is a media star. He did such a great job in uh, uh, in the conversation last night. So. Uh, I think thank you both for being with us uh, and willing to share your thoughts and uh, even and agree or disagree as you see fit. Um, obviously, 2020 is a unique year uh, for the world, uh, for the global swine industry, for the U.S. swine industry, and for the Layman Conference. Um, so I think to to kick things off, I might ask uh, Jordan just to uh, share with us a couple of things that he thought were. Uh, um, major uh, impressions or takeaways that he's got from the meeting. So over to you, Gordon. Sure. Thank you, uh, Peter. And by the way, uh, congratulations, Clayton. Uh, we should lead with that. Uh, very well-deserved recognition. And Peter, in your introduction, I'm honored to be here. I, I'm not sure about the leadership part on opinions. I know I have an opinion. I'm not sure I, I have a, uh, an opinion leader. But what struck me, uh, first of all, just the format, right? Uh, the Hats off to the layman team and hats off to Andy Vance and Mike and his team. Uh, gosh, I, I found it, the format to be very good. Uh, I found it to be easy to, to navigate and uh, the chats and the participation I, I find uh, good. I, I'd, I'd, I'd be curious to hear uh, feedback, uh, Peter and Clayton. Well, let Clayton have a, have a word there. Yeah, I thought that it was a very good virtual format and I really liked the use of the chat function. I appreciate all the participants and their willingness to jump onto that chat function and engage with our speakers. Um, you know, these virtual platforms have limitations, but they do allow you to interact with folks that you may never get a chance to, to interact with. Um, I just came in to hear from the ASF session and Dr. Jason Yan joined us from China where it is, I uh, believe, 1.36 in the morning right now. Um, but his willingness to jump in and, and share his thoughts with any of our participants to me is, is one of the most valuable pieces of layman and harder to do that in person when you've got a 14 hour plane trip on either side of those layman, uh, those layman meetings and interactions than in this virtual platform. So I really encourage people, you know, if you don't know Jason, talk to him because the guy is doing things that most of the rest of us haven't had to haven't had to do. We haven't had to battle ASF in our backyard yet. And he's the thought leader on what to do in an endemic country right now with partial depopulation. So to, to me, that level of engagement is really neat to see. It's, it embodies the spirit of the layman conference. And I think we pulled it off pretty well in this year's virtual platform. Yeah, I'll just comment uh, from our side, uh, Gordon. We we I think gone into this with our hearts in our mouths. You know, for the first time we're learning. Uh, so I think our first uh, reaction is one of enormous relief that uh, so far so good. Uh, the technology's been good. The participation's been good. So we're we're really happy. And I think as Clayton says, the the uh, it does add things that we wouldn't otherwise has. And so I think that'll be a interesting discussion. Um, about future events, we—I mean—we'd like to uh, hope we can uh, 
uh, elbow bump and look each other in the eye uh, at next year's meeting. But it is possible that there'd be scope for even a hybrid event where we could have uh, part of the, the issue through a platform like this just to welcome the international participation, which otherwise would be perhaps impossible. So I think, uh, and in saying that, uh, uh, we'll be really keen to get feedback from all the uh, people who participated. There will be a survey on the uh, is that is uh, on the um, a schedule page, and and I think Andy is going to paste uh, uh, there. There it is. It's coming up now. Uh, the link here. So, uh, by all means, um, send us your feedback, your thoughts, the things we can do better. Uh, as Bob would have it, do it. Let's uh, let's keep uh, learning and uh, uh, and trying to have good fun. And and certainly, thank you for your for your comments on that. Um, now let's turn our attention to uh, the pig and uh, and the sure. industry and uh, how we're feeling sure. there. But uh, sure. I, I think that to answer your question more directly, Peter, the, the fun part, right, the, the, there's some quotes that I thought, uh, well, I, I would call them shockers, right? Uh, and maybe the fun part will be all these uh, presentations are linked and they're, they're cataloged, so you can go back and we'll have a little fun. Uh, Peter, uh, who, who said it's time to shrink the sow herd? And uh, balance your pig flow. That that, that was an interesting comment. Yeah, to me. yeah I think it was uh, uh, Mill Mortensen uh, right. said that in the Hanor thing, and I thought that was an interesting comment too, because yeah, we had comments about supply management uh, earlier in the in the conference, uh, issues of price discovery and supply meeting demands. So I think there was a lot of concentration uh, around that area. But uh, yeah, the part that Mill highlighted to me was really a uh, the enterprise focus of that in an in integrated industry saying, you know, within their system, we can't do it with everyone, but we, we're we going to have to match our um, supply with our uh, outlets and those relationships. So you see even, a, a, you might argue, a sort of a, a level of hyper integration where, uh, where you've got uh, nuclei of production that are uh, operating within themselves. And that's, you know, that's a very long way from where the industry was when I came to the US uh, quite a while back now. Yeah, comments on that, uh, Clayton. You know, I think one of the best quotes that I heard the entire time, Peter and Gordon, was during Mark Greenwood's presentation yesterday morning. And Mark highlighted uh, how consumers see us relative to other proteins. He had that one slide that kind of showed different attributes that consumers value and where do they stack rank pork relative to our competitors. And I thought Mark did a wonderful job of highlighting that what we think is the back of our baseball card, right? The PSY metrics and the grade A pigs and those things, feed conversion, average daily gain, the consumer doesn't necessarily agree with those metrics being most important. And I think Mark kind of quote something to the effect of, we need to come out of the challenges we've had this year with a thought of how are we going to improve our competitive position relative to other proteins on those attributes that consumers really value. And to me, that's a, a wonderful call to action for the next decade as we try and adjust what we value to match with consumer values. I think that's a Exactly right, Clayton. That that slide, I think, uh, Peter and Clayton, I think that was a National Pork Board slide that he credited, yep. uh, and it, it came up in other speakers' uh, presentations also, where for the our listeners, that uh, is an important slide to go back and review because it put U.S. pork in sixth spot behind not only other proteins, but behind plant-based uh, uh, sources of, of nutrition, as I understood the slide, and that that's a uh, that's a wake up moment, I think, to the industry, uh, Peter and Clayton. Yeah. yeah, as I think I mentioned to you, Gordon, I think that that slide sort of uh, resonated through a lot of the meeting, and that point coming up uh, again of of uh, our historic focus on the nuts and bolts and uh, and the practical efficiencies uh, uh, being a little bit um, unlinked from uh, things that are driving consumer. Um, Decisions and I, I think a lot of speakers touched on that either directly or, or, or obliquely and, and I think there's a you know challenge that came out of it uh, um, uh, in uh, I think um, Mark's uh, talk about uh, needing a new quarterback and who's the quarterback uh, uh, he was talking about the Vikings but I, I think how do we uh, where's the leadership need to come from because this is a massive undertaking you can see the the, the industry splintering, of, if that's a word, of people 
pursuing niche opportunities. That's already happening. Uh, yeah. But can the industry as a as a, a, a relatively monolithic structure say, okay, let's all do this together? Uh, and or, or is it going to be a, a matter of uh, each person pursuing the opportunity in the niche that they see? It is is there a is there a role for integrated leadership in the industry, or is this going to be a, a market driven thing where where everyone's got to find their own direction? Yeah, a couple of interesting. Jeff, the Jeff Warstel talk uh, presentation would speak to that issue, uh, Peter and Clayton. Uh, I'd encourage everybody. Uh, to go back and see that one again, and, and he talks about leadership. And uh, Michelle Crom today talked about the poultry, where in a crisis, uh, leadership, you know, it, it's not a, a good quote there was, uh, in a crisis, not a good time to go meet your neighbors. Yeah. And as a swine industry, uh, we, we need to learn those lessons so that we don't have to relearn them when the poultry industry has already lived through them in high path AI in 2015. And I'd encourage everyone to go back and review Michelle's slides. It's a really nice presentation. Yeah, I think um, when, I, when I think about leadership, Peter, I think that we may not find a quarterback who is going to write the script for the game, you know, coach the practice, um, drive the bus, make the after game Gatorades and all those sorts of things. But I think National Pork Board has kind of given us a, a vision of what that can look like. They, they brought awareness to us and you can't make change until you have awareness. And I think they can continue to bring that awareness to us by always reminding us what the consumer values. And I think through that, we can create a, a vision that we can share of where we want the industry to be 10 years from now. And if we do that, I feel very confident that the industry will evolve. I think each individual decision maker will take sustainability into account when they make practical decisions for how they're going to manage the next decade. And you know, key to that sustainability piece will be making sure that we meet the demands of a, of a consumer that maybe today doesn't feel like we're trying to do things to help what they care about. Very good, Clayton. Yeah. Uh, just on, a, on another uh, angle, I think one of the things that I, I picked up on, you know, we had our sessions on new technology. I, I couldn't get all of it, but I, I, I watched some of it and things, new approaches coming up on the weekend and and particularly the big data angle and all the sensors and environmental monitoring, all this enormous potential for, for doing things differently. Uh, and then uh, Dave Wade of Hanor was asking, you know, what, what technology would you... Uh, uh, wish we had in the industry, and he said uh, something that would make the feed flow into the finishing barns. <laughs> and uh, it really struck me then, uh, as you know, the 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 distance between some of the real problems that are that can hold things up, and and what all the, the bells and whistles of modern technology can do. So I was going to uh, put that question to you guys. If you know, in, if someone asked you Dave's question, you know, what's the little piece of technology that you wish that you had uh, uh, to uh, to move us into the into the into the future? I'll jump in, um, Peter. I think technology that helps us from a biosecurity and traceability standpoint has tremendous value when we think about our own animal disease today. Um, we know we're not in a good situation to know where all the pigs are instantly. Um, if there was technology out there that could better help us manage down times and really just track people, pigs, and trucks, I think that would be something that the industry needs to embrace. And I know that there are, are active attempts to uh, I think getting everybody onto the same platform would be kind of the next step as we think about what, what we need in technology in that space. I, I think it's a great question, Peter, uh, and congratulations to Zach Talbert. I think I have the name right. Uh, the student uh, with his uh, bio box, I think uh, he referred to it on his presentation. So that's a piece of technology uh, directly related to biosecurity. Jason Yan talked about biosecurity. Uh, in his China presentation. And so anything we can do to improve biosecurity, even as simple as the little things coming into the farm where uh, that sure looked like an interesting concept to improve the D&D &D room, Clayton and, and Peter, that uh, I think that's a nice piece of technology. Just make biosecurity more uh, applicable and more effective 
right? He has a nice set of data where the D&D room may not be effective. Even though we think we're doing the right thing, mm -hmm. it may not actually be uh, the intervention of choice in regards to pathogens coming into our farm. So, I, uh, you know, I, I, th I thought that was just fascinating, uh, his presentation. And congratulations to him, by the way. Yeah, and, and I think it's very exciting for, um, uh, as you know, uh, several of the ways we, we've tried to honour Bob's legacy uh, with the conference is, is that award itself. And I, and I think if um, um, Zach, as a, as a winner, ends up filing a, a patent for his, uh, for his apparatus, uh, I think Bob will be smiling down on us in a, in a big way to, to see if we'd have a DBM student come through and, uh, and do that. Yeah. And I think one of the nice things about this technology that's key to any innovation is it's easy to implement. You know, it doesn't require the farm team to learn a whole new skill set. Um, it's not a complicated computer program. There's no difficult management strategies to it. And when I think of applying innovation on the farm, I would much rather have something that's just a slight improvement that I would easily implement than something that is maybe revolutionary, but it's impossible to implement and I can't actually get it done. Peter, as we're speaking, you asked me for a technology to help me turn my phone off while I'm doing more important things. Uh, I'll, I'll, I like that technology. Yeah, I think I think I can send you to a how-to guide for for old guys, uh, Gordon, to help you with that. <laughs> That's why they keep the old guys around. I'll send you the, I'll send you the link. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, a couple of other things. Uh, first of all, anything more, you guys, before I throw another curveball at you? Uh, um, uh, any comments you'd like to make or issues you wanted to raise? We've got about uh, five or six minutes left, I think, to, well, to chat. The One of the keynotes uh, on Monday, Bill, uh, uh, from Dow, uh, you know, when he stated there's, there is no price discovery, and uh, he talked about uh, how there's differences in the industry, which is uh, not allowing us to speak as one voice. I think that's an important thing to note, and I'd encourage, at least in the U.S., I'd encourage uh, the audience to to listen carefully to Bill's talk. That that was a pretty striking statement he made. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think I think at one point you sent me a note saying uh, uh, Bill's talk's more important than COVID. I think in terms of uh, looking forward and price discovery, and I, I think the. Uh, always difficult subject of uh, what the future looks like for the smaller independent producers uh, who, uh, you know, in a lot of the issues about integration and Merle's talk. And uh, I, I think that uh, Bill's talk particularly uh, highlights some of the some of the challenges there and, and one of the really difficult areas to work in. He made some nice points about the if we want independent producers to survive, we need uh, price discovery and we need uh, access to capital for those producers. So a very uh, insightful presentation that Bill gave. Couldn't agree more. And uh, I may have a very cold take that may not uh, go over very well. So I apologize, Peter, if a bunch of people drop off after this. But one thing that I've heard repeatedly throughout the conference and throughout the year is the, the shrinking of the pig industry and, and even suggestion that we should come together to define how to shrink the pig industry um, and talk about, well, poultry did it. All right. And I don't, I'm not an expert in the poultry industry, but it seems like about every other month, poultry executives get arrested for these sorts of things. <laughs> I would, I would caution us on going down that road and, you know, it's difficult enough to get into this industry. I know from my own experience growing up as a young man who was never going to inherit a farm, never going to have these things given to me, the price of entry is already exceptionally high for people who want to enter our industry. And I worry that, that we could close the thoughts of our industry if we try to go down a path of controlled supply. We live in a capitalistic marketplace. Free markets do dictate the 10% of the supply that needs to go out. We have a mechanism in place to let this, to, to facilitate this. It's one we trust. It's the American way of life. It's the American way of pig production. I'm proud of it. I'm proud of our independence. And I will grasp that as tight as I possibly can, as long as I can, Peter and Gordon. I'm passionate about that. So I want us to be very careful as we, as we journey down that pathway. And, uh, and, and I think at the, at the end there, the issue you get to is when, when do you stop having truly competitive markets uh, okay. as, as consolidation happens? And I think, uh, I think one of our disadvantages in COVID has just been the biological lag. And I think the, the fact that the poultry industry in a time of a disease emergency 
were able to smash eggs and 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 adjust their supply. We adjusted our supply too in a less but in a more problematic area. I think it's one of our competitive disadvantages uh, uh, against poultry is that we've got a 10-month uh, production span and they've got a 10-week production span. And uh, I think that that's a very different thing than uh, than um, managing supply for, for uh, motives of pure profitability. And, and I think in the, truly in the in the protein markets, I'm not sure that that's that hard to do because there are substitutes. So even if, uh, let's say, worst case scenario, we had people who were manipulating supply in the swine industry, uh, I don't really think it's got a big future because uh, people will eat other things. So, you know, the food market, we, at the end of the day, we're competing for stomach space. Um, mm. and, and I think uh, it's hard to have a non-competitive market and, uh, um, in, at, at that level. Yeah, but it's an interesting. It's one of these things that uh, one of the times we need a beer, and you can argue long and hard about. I think Clayton, but yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Final thoughts from both of you. We just have a few minutes left, so uh, um, final sure. thoughts. I'll let uh, Clayton's the uh, recipient of the award. I'll let him go last and have the last <laughs> word uh, if that's appropriate. Uh, you know, with COVID, ASF uh, around the world. The old quote, uh, Clayton and Peter, is uh, uh, plans are useless, planning is indispensable. And the opposite side of that coin is good planning without good work is useless. And so I think with COVID, with the potential for ASF and foreign animal disease, those that coin is very important for us as an industry to keep uh, in mind. Uh, we we need to plan, but the plans may be useless compared to what may actually happen in a crisis. Uh, I think, again, Michelle Crom had some nice words of wisdom about making sure that uh, uh, we can lead and uh, communication and and even, even in the technology we're using, face-to-face -face is still very, very important. And so we're going to have to wade our way through that. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to participate in the session uh, this year, uh, Peter. And thank you and congratulations to the entire uh, Minnesota team for the a job well done. Thanks very much, Gordon. Always wow. a great contributor to our meeting. Uh, Clayton. Yep. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Gordon. Um, you know, when I think of uh, this year and everything we've heard at the Layman Conference, it, it all revolves around COVID. Um, and no matter your personal feelings on COVID, um, how it's impacted you, you we all have to appreciate um, what a, a massive impact and headwind it's had on our industry. And I think that there are tremendous analogies to take from the COVID situation to our preparedness for foreign animal disease. That will be the next disaster that we have to, we have to take on as an industry. Now, I don't have the crystal ball to know when and exactly how that'll play out, but I think um, a, another black swan health event is going to come our way at some point. We've learned about our capabilities with euthanasia and disposal. We've learned about our capabilities from a national standpoint in testing and the challenges that have played out there. And that's with a human health pandemic, probably a little bit more resources available than what we're going to experience with the animal health pandemic. We know that there are animal health pandemics knocking at our door. The ASF free parts of the world are smaller and smaller every single month. We lose ground, lose ground, lose ground. I think that if we we are honest with ourselves and debrief how we as an industry have handled the COVID challenges and try to use that information to gear up towards the next battle, the, the big battle against likely ASF, as much as we don't want to say it, I think that we will come out of this having gained things from COVID that we never would have without COVID coming in and attacking us. What doesn't kill us make us stronger. And COVID hasn't killed us. We are better today than we were six months ago. And I would argue a lot better because we've been stress tested really, really hard. Keep the pressure on, 
keep pushing forward, keep evolving our industry, and know that there are bigger, worse enemies out there than COVID that we have to be prepared for. Now, all that being said, I'm very optimistic because we've survived this stress test. It's not been fun, um, and there have been parts of it that maybe we didn't survive very well, but we've made it through it. And this lay, this layman uh, virtual conference, I think, is a testament to the perseverance that the pig industry has. You throw problems at us, we will figure out solutions to them. Right. The first right. one may not work, second one may not work, but we will get there because we are dogmatic in our approach. We use science as our anchor and we come to conclusions quickly and make the best decisions that we can. Great comments from both of you. Thanks very much, Clayton uh, uh, and Gordon. Uh, at this point, uh, I'd just like to uh, wind things up and uh, uh, usual uh, a number of comments to make. First of all, the materials will, will be available online for you all through February. So you get your chance to go back and, and feed at your leisure from the smorgasbord. So uh, make sure that you, that you do that. We do really want your comments. Uh, and the survey link is there. Uh, Andy has, uh, has put it up and it's also through the schedule page. Uh, and it's sincere. We want to make the meeting better again next year. We need your help and input to do that. Uh, finally, um, the second harvest numbers, uh, great effort by our community to donate. So uh, thank everybody for that. Uh, and what uh, broader thank yous, first of all, uh, to all our speakers and all our participants who are key part of the meeting. Our sponsors, obviously, uh, without them, the meeting would not have been able to exist. So thank you all. And it's not too late to visit their, their booths if you hadn't had a chance to get there. Um, and I think uh, finally, uh, all my colleagues at the university, but uh, in particular, Monsi, who is our quarterback, uh, and she has taken the lion's share of the work here. So uh, it's a team effort, but uh, the team doesn't function well without a good leader. So thanks, Monsi. Uh, thanks, Clayton and Gordon. Thanks to our whole community and stay safe. And we'll see you next year, virtually or in person. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter.